Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Ms. Pal of TEM Center Special Council Meeting. It's Monday, February 14th at 9 a.m. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. And I'm going to call this meeting to order. Are there any additions to the agenda? There are no additions. Okay. Um, looking now for disclosure of pecuniary interest. Anyone have anything to declare? No, if not, if any time during the meeting, you're welcome to do that. Um, now we are starting our visioning session regarding housing and planning and development. And I believe, Mr. Bancroft, this is all yours. Uh, thank you. Your um, the current housing situation in the municipality and see where we can go in terms of um, addressing our future needs while ensuring that we are fiscally responsible with our um, with the decisions that we make. Um, so today's discussion. So today's discussion, Your Worship, will be rather useful in terms of assisting with the official plan review where I plan on re-engaging the public um, next month with our discussion paper findings and ultimately lending itself to uh, policy change in our uh, official plan. So how did we get to where we are now? So just to recap, at the November 8th, 2021 regular meeting of council, there was a resolution that was passed that the Vista Woods uh, subdivision proposal be deferred and that staff arrange a council visioning session to discuss planning and development in our community. So in terms of presentation structure for this morning, um, I wanna look at uh, what the current state of housing is in the municipality, also what the market response has been, as well as residential targets that could apply, um, some housing affordability tools, the importance of housing choice and also discussion. But first and foremost, um, I am certainly open at any part of the discussion, Your Worship, to entertain any comments or um, any questions, even though I've got uh, discussion at the tail end of my presentation, by all means, if there's a need to um, discuss during the presentation, I certainly welcome that. So to start, um, I think some of us may be familiar with this report, uh, Baby Needs a New Home, that was uh, produced by Mike Moffitt, who's a professor at, uh, at Western's Ivy Business School. So he's an economist, and this uh, report, it's rather comprehensive in nature, and it's based on projections for housing demand in the province. Um, one of the caveats um, within the preamble that I found interesting, it, uh, it says in, in black and white, it's not intended to be used as a replacement for planning documents. So I thought I would throw that in there. But what's most important are his findings. So he mentions in Ontario, 1 million new homes will be required over the next 10 years and that the demand for housing has outpaced supply resulting in escalating housing prices. And this is something that's not limited to the GTA. This is affecting all of uh, Southern Ontario um, and even locally here in Thames Center in that um, it's a case of looking for housing options in terms of a relief valve going away from the GTA. And this is affecting us all in some capacity. Also with the report, specifically as it uh, reflects um, the Middlesex area, which also includes the city of London, um, we've got unprecedented growth and development that is affecting the region that's shown on that bar graph. Um, and uh, TEM Center is included. So you'll see that um, from 2016 to 2021, you know, we it jumps to 43,000. And then going up to um, within the five years following that to basically 51,000. So there's definitely a need to um, address housing, not only, um, you know, as it applies to the city of London, but 
the Middlesex region as a whole, including Thames Center. So in taking all this information into account in terms of the, the housing supply uh, crisis, uh, in terms of provincial response, um, the, uh, through the Premier's office, um, arranged for a housing summit, I guess with uh, some of the bigger city uh, mayors to seek solutions to build more homes. And then following that, we had um, a funding announcement at the Roma conference um, in terms of modernization funding to be available for, um, to improve public service uh, delivery and to streamline development approvals. So on our end, um, locally, we do already have um, e-permitting in place pertaining to um, uh, building services from a public service delivery, which is certainly um, gaining um, efficiencies. Um, but we're also, um, I guess the next part of that process is to deal with um, uh, a planning module where um, that's something that we're focused on for uh, 2022, notwithstanding this uh, funding announcement from the province, considering we've already received funding for that uh, particular project. The other thing that the province is doing is uh, proposed amendments to the Planning Act. Uh, so this is just in bill form for now, um, but for options for delegation of authority to staff for quote unquote straightforward uh, rezoning applications. And that could include uh, the removal of holding from zoning as well as um, temporary use bylaws. Um, and I guess even more recently, as early as I believe it was a week ago, the province released a provincial task force report, um, which included five key uh, recommendations to increase the supply of uh, market housing being 1.5 million homes over the next 10 years. Um, but they're key areas of, of, of focus in terms of recommendation. So making changes to planning policy and zoning to allow for a greater density and increase the mix of housing. Also reducing and streamlining um, urban design rules to lower cost of development. Depoliticize the approvals process to address nimbyism and cut red tape to speed up housing and prevent abuse and backlog um, in dealing with the Ontario Land Tribunal. Um, and also align efforts between all levels of government to incentivize more housing. <laughs> When you say depoliticize the approvals process to address NIMBYism, how do you think that's going to happen? Well, like it's something I, to say it, something to do it, right? I guess it'll all boil down to whether or not, um, you know, the province through the legislature is willing to go that extra step. So, will it be administration that that's it? Well, I guess that's one way of dealing with it. Um, I guess another way the province could deal with it is to qualify the types of appeals that could be allowed. So those that could be allowed versus those that would have been allowed under the current regime, but are no longer allowed now. I think if I can add your worship, is it's very early the the information that's coming out from mark to have a good handle on it at this point all we are getting right now is that the province is going to come up with an education package that is going to assist us in getting that out to the to the communities i know it's at a thirty thousand foot level i used that term earlier this morning it's it it'll be it'll require our assistance to put that out to the public to get them to understand what we can do and what we can't do what you can do as council and what you can't do and what would be appealable moving forward in, in that so it's we're really relying on them to help us help you or and help the public at the at the end of the day um if i could also add your worship um the other thing according to this task force report um they spell out the fact that it's not an all or nothing approach um, there are numerous recommendations following those key areas. And that's not to say that every single one of them are going to be implemented, but I guess it will come from um, the will of um, the legislature in terms of what approach they want to take in terms of moving forward. Thank you. 
So, and also, you know, the fact that, um, of course, this year as a provincial election, who knows if any changes are going to come about because things are happening rather quickly. So, okay. so um, in terms of providing um, some housing planning context, we talked a little bit about what's happening. Go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Yes, uh, you can hear me, Mayor Work. Yep, loud and clear. All right, uh, thank you. Um, why, um, why are we relying on the province to tell us what to do with in terms of our um, housing? Why, why can't we just do what we want to do? Um, so, through you, Your Worship, um, the province is at the top of the planning framework. So the province, um, through the Planning Act, um, also through the provincial policy statement, which basically implements uh, key matters of provincial interest, it is through those documents that is the foundation for land use planning in Ontario. So um, that's where um, we don't have any choice through your worship. We have to follow the lead, the direction that is offered by the province and you know implement that direction locally so does that answer your question councillor patterson uh yes it does thank you Mayor Ward. okay all right and i would imagine like i mean we're looking at aaron who has to follow the ontario building code we can't just do what we want to do i mean that doesn't work that way and same with planning yeah. councillor yep. heyman um, just a point of clarification. So I'm, am I correct in understanding that we're uh, anticipating some changes from the province and we want to be in alignment? Um, through your worship, oh, I guess we could be anticipating some changes. Um, yeah, I would, I would agree with that, uh, that comment. Not sure why I turned my mic off, considering I'm going to be doing most of the talking here. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Um, so that's 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 the um, the um, context at the provincial level. Now I want to move on to um, you know what is happening regionally, I guess through Middlesex County first, and then we'll talk about locally in terms of how this impacts things with uh, Thames Center. So with the county, um, they came out with a homeless. Um, prevention and housing plan, um, I guess back a, a few years ago. And the goal of that document was to improve the supply of affordable housing and supportive housing in the county. Also, um, uh, a strategy that includes support to help retain housing and avoid homelessness. But more importantly, as it applies to Thames Center, to provide a more diverse range of housing options. So that is something that we can certainly um, encourage more um, locally. So in that regard, let's talk a little bit about what. Deputy Mary Ellen, question? Through you, Worship, um, just a few comments before we move on just about the homelessness um, and attainable housing plan through the county. I think this is really important to look at um, and just some, I pulled out some stats out of that because um, the Human Rights Commission says that that we should spend no more than 25 to 30 percent of our income on housing um, and the definition of affordable uh, housing is spending no more than 30 percent of your income on housing and this report came out in in 2019 and the stats at that point and that was before housing prices went insane was 45 percent of middlesex residents were spending more than 30 percent of their income on housing costs alone and so that just shows here in middlesex county um, before the pandemic hit and before this housing crisis hit that we were already at really in Middlesex County, we were already at a, at a crisis that people can't afford to live here. And even, um, I can't remember the, the stats that came out, but um, 
the exact numbers that came out when we were doing this homelessness plan at the county level, but it was the average Middlesex County resident could not afford a home in Middlesex County in 2019. And so that just goes to show how important this plan is. And the reason why we need that diverse range of housing options, because people need to be able to afford what they have on their income. And you know, when I, I watch comments on social media about housing and, and what people should be able to afford, and I think there's some misconception that Middlesex is a very well-to-do place and that everybody can get by, and and, and that's not the case. And um, in that report, it was 10% of Middlesex residents can't afford to cover their basic costs of food and rent. Um, and that even here in Thames Center um, from Jean Davis, this past Christmas, it was 89 kids and 97 adults is what she ended up helping the food, the Thames Center Food Bank helped over the Christmas season. So, you know, it, as much as we like to believe and, and be naive in the fact that no one's struggling here in, in Thames Center, in Middlesex County, that's not the case. And we need to take this very seriously when it comes to what housing options we have. Well, I think we saw in the news, you know, last week, of the fellow that was sleeping in the store in Strathroy. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he was sleeping there and then he was going off to work. He, he didn't have anywhere to live. He had a job and he, and he was that way, but nowhere to live. And, and that's the kind of homelessness that we see, you know, throughout the county. I believe, Councillor Patterson, you had your hand up. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor Work. Um, do we have statistics that say that there's homeless people in Temp Center? rather than Middlesex County, just Temp Center specifically? Well, those statistics on homelessness is hard to achieve because it goes in many, many different ways. It could be just simply couch surfing, somebody that may not be living at home, but is borrowing apartments or, or in and out. And we have people that do access um, to different shelters within the city and come back out again. So it's it's hard to say Temp Center um, specifically, but I think Count uh, Deputy Mayor, do you have your hand up? Yeah. I'll maybe. I'll maybe just um, add to that. Uh, the Rural Ontario Institute just came out um, last year with a really good. Um, report on homelessness and hidden homelessness in rural and Northern Ontario. And like Mayor Warwick was saying, it's especially in rural and small communities, um, hidden homelessness is, is the part where it's couch surfing. It's, um, it's not, you know, seeing, seeing someone who is unhoused on the street corner. That's not what we see in our small communities. And so it's hard to quantify. Um, in addition, um, and this is something we've had a lot of conversations at Middlesex County in, is the fact that we don't offer services in Middlesex County. Those resources aren't here. We don't have shelters here. So they're going into the city of London to access those. And if they're not saying, you know, I'm from Dorchester, then we don't even know where in the city of London, we don't even know where they're coming from. And we've had such a, the way the system has been built is it's very urban centric, especially in Southwestern Ontario, where everybody goes into the city of London to access those resources, because that's where they are. Whereas we need to start, and we've seen the shift in the last couple of years start offering services in their communities because it's not fair if someone is experiencing homelessness in Dorchester that they have to leave their community where they possibly have some sort of support in order to go into the city of London where they have no one. I think the other type of, <clears throat> of situation that it isn't visible but what it is is sometimes it's it's living arrangements where somebody is living in a house, but is there on the understanding to do work in the house or provide different um, <clears throat> arrangements for the person that's owning the house. So those aren't visible, but they're there. There's a lot of people that are in those situations and can't get out of those situations. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Just very quickly, um, I just want to point out that homelessness was one of the items that we flagged, um, not only as a, a county committee um, with all of our municipalities coming together, but Tem Center specifically put it into an acknowledgement in the community safety and well-being plan that was adopted last year. So just keeping that in mind as we're moving forward. Okay, moving right along then. <clears throat> so in terms of locally, this slide um, 
provides an explanation as to our current housing stock. And it's broken down in terms of um, housing type. And you'll see that um, uh, there's no doubt that uh, we are predominantly a single detached um, dwelling um, housing community, topping 90%. And then, you know, we have single percentage points with um, other forms, including semis, row housing or, or townhouse dwellings and, um, you know, being even lesser in dealing with um, multiple units through um, apartments and so on and so forth. So that's that's the current situation. Moving right along with um, approved housing plans through plans of subdivision, uh, you'll notice that there's been a change. So we go from ever so slightly, we go from about um, 90, 91% single detached dwellings to 87%. And then we've got 2% for semis, 11% for row housing, nothing for apartments. And, um, and basically what this is saying is um, the uh, development industry has has reacted um, from a marketing standpoint in terms of the need of providing um, a, a mix of housing types. What's also interesting to note is in dealing with approved plans, we're kind of looking at the past because it takes um, um, a number of years to go through the planning approval process. So in reality, we may be looking through this data of, of um, development that would have been approved from a draft plan perspective, you know, five to 10 years ago. And then moving right along, we've got um, housing proposed in preliminary plans. So this is, this is more current. So these are conceptual plans from the development community um, who have an interest in developing their lands for, um, for residential development, but have not come forward with um, applications for uh, planning approvals. So that's why this is preliminary or conceptual in nature. And again, you'll see that um, the development community has, has reacted to um, escalating land prices and um, housing prices going up and as such um, understand the need to provide uh, a mix of housing types, housing choice, which in itself uh, demonstrates um, affordability. So as I said, in terms of shift in housing market, um, we are experiencing a change with developers proposing more housing options than ever before. And historically, we've been predominantly um, single, de single detached um, housing stock, um, but the housing market is evolving in response to um, housing supply shortage, escalating land prices, and the need to be a more affordable product. And at the end of the day, million dollar mortgages are not sustainable. So then we have um, tools that could be available in terms of uh, promoting um, a mix of housing. So we have the ability to set targets um, according to housing type or density, but it begs the question, um, what's the appropriate mix of housing type in the municipality, uh, considering currently there is no standard. And um, a target for a housing mix that could be appropriate which is in line with um, the, the current housing shift, we could be looking at with low density residential, having a target of you know, 65% in the form of single and semis, and then with medium density residential, um, looking at 35% just to get the discussion going. So with medium density residential, that would include um, townhouses, um, apartments, um, three or um, four stories or less. So that's, um, <clears throat> I guess that's, um, I'm looking at engaging council if there's any questions in regards to um, setting these types of targets. 
at, at the same time, um, it's not as if planning is etched in stone. Planning is constantly an evolving process where change happens. And it's not as if, if we commit to setting these types of, of, of minimum targets that um, we're not in a position to change these targets after the fact. Because after all, in dealing with um, the official plan, we have to update and fine tune every five years. So if we find out that um, through monitoring and whatnot, that these targets are not appropriate, either too high or too low, then we make the necessary adjustment. But again, um, your worship, um, this is certainly in line with um, development activity that is proposed relative to, as this slide indicates, um, the, these conceptual plans that have been provided um, by the development community for parcels of land that are designated uh, residential where applications have not been filed to, um, to to create the land for residential or develop the land for residential purposes. So I'm going to go back to that target slide again. So I'm not sure if uh, members of council had any any comments to share. And if not, I can. Oh, I see uh, Councillor Patterson has a question. Yeah, Councillor Heeman, and then Councillor Patterson. Yeah, I think that's um, interesting way of looking at it just in terms of um, having a discussion about the diversity of units and where we are currently and the lack thereof. And I think that it, uh, it makes it a little bit more easy to understand where our community is coming from and that this is a big shift. Um, that said, I, th I think that um, the higher density is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a matter of keeping it in in line with the, the sense of community feel that we have currently. And I, I think that's the challenge and the opportunity that we have. Right. Okay. Councillor Patterson. Uh, thank you, Mayor Work. Um, my question is, is, I know the housing pricing is a very complex issue and there's, there's federal, there's provincial, there's and then there's the demographics and market. Um, how much does uh, development charges affect um, um, the price of housing? Through your worship, I would imagine that development charges has a pretty nominal effect in the grand scheme of things from, um, you know, in terms of purchasing a house, a new house, um, the amount that you pay relative to the DC that you pay. Um, I don't think it's significant um, by any means. Um, and when I say not significant, it could be off the top of my head, like 5% maybe of the total purchase price of the house. But I think it's nominal in the grand scheme of things. Okay. Um, just... Before I take your question, Deputy Mayor Elliott, I know that we had a discussion the other day and it, you know, you're saying planning doesn't have to be static, it can change. And you just wonder how we got to this point that we we needed large houses on large lots. Like and, and it seems to be something that everybody wants, but when you go back and you look historically, let's go to Montreal or Quebec City or places like that where there's, you know old homes together like you know stone houses row houses you go to england and there's all sorts of they're not they're not uh, cheap by any means they're but they're homes that are together very close to the road and that's the way it was built and that's what it was so i just don't know how we got to this point maybe when you went to uh, school for planning they told you how we got here i think we've gotten to the point where we're at because um the price of land wasn't what it is today. So it was much cheaper. Um, there's a lot, there were a lot less restrictions in terms of how land was developed. And I think we've come to a crossroad where notwithstanding the housing crisis, it's all about providing housing choice that can um, apply 
to um, individuals in all stages of their life. So that way we don't have members of the community that like for entry level housing, for example, they don't have to move elsewhere where we've got that housing choice available in Temp Center. And that also applies to empty nesters. That also applies to seniors. So that's why it's critical to have that um, housing choice available because at the end of the day, it makes the community more sustainable. If I may, Your Worship, I'll just add, um, there's been an evolution. You know, we used to go to our, our parks and, and have, uh, have a picnic and leave all our garbage laying on the ground. Um, much like that, to, to compare the analogy, we had urban sprawl and we allowed this to happen and we moved out and out and out, especially out from the GTA. And we took up all this land and now we're to a point where there's an anticipated 900,000 to a million homes coming to the province. 300,000 of them are going to be in the Middlesex County area and we don't want to sacrifice our farmland. So this is this is one of the alternatives that we have to make to allow this to happen. So part of it's been an evolution where we allowed things in the past that just won't work is if we continue down that road. Deputy Ray Elliott. Yeah, I mean, just echo uh, before my question, I'll just echo uh, RCAO's comments and the fact that you know, we've seen the GTA and, and even in the city of London, we've seen that sprawl happen. We're seeing it in, in Ingersoll where they're wanting to sprawl out into Zora Township and and we can't we can't do that anymore. And you, and you see the OFA um, coming to that when they came out with that homegrown policy. And, it, and it's a great policy in the fact that we can't sacrifice our farmland anymore. We've done it for far too long. And we're at that critical point where we can't do it anymore. We have to protect what we have. Um, but going back to the development charges um, point that was being made uh, last week in the recommendations um, from the task force, one of the recommendations was um, that municipalities could develop um, a corporation utility model for water and wastewater um, under, the, under which the corporation could borrow and amortize the costs um, among the customers instead of using the development charges. And I had a conversation with our director of finance about this, because I think one thing with the development charges, you know, we can say as a municipality, it costs X dollars to provide services in order to have this growth. And, and from a development standpoint, they're able to budget that to say, you know, this is how much it's gonna cost. And what I fear is moving away from the development charges and coming into a corporation, all of a sudden you're taking what costs to have growth in terms of water and wastewater infrastructure. And now you're taking it out of development charges and putting it directly on the backs of residents. And they're saying that in terms of, well, it'll make housing cheaper because now your development costs are cheaper, but then who's to say the developer is actually taking those save, those development charge savings? Like, and it could be that, that the homeowner now pays twice for water and wastewater infrastructure. And so I really worry about moving away from development charges and, and those fixed costs to what it costs to have that development, because then the homeowner is only paying once. Thank you, Worship. Um, I may add to that a little bit. I can tell you, uh, Council, that two of our major projects that are happening in the community this year are 100% funded um, by development charges, and that's our accessible park and our, our new ball diamond at the ORC. So just keep that in mind as you're having discussion. Um, so going back to these residential, oh, sorry. Councillor Patterson, do you have a question? Um, yeah, just uh, thank you, Mayor Work. Uh, in terms of residential targets, um, I, all I hear from the community when they call me, they email me, they text me, and we have conversations that they want seniors' homes and they don't want um, big row houses. They want single, you know, single floor housing. And I don't hear anything about this entry level homes where you know, it's really small lots and they go really high. Like, I don't hear that from the community. So I'm not sure that that's what our community wants. Yeah, I, I appreciate the comment, uh, Councillor Patterson. Um, but 
you know, at, at the end of the day, um, if if we facilitate housing choice, if we provide more options, then um, that in itself gives an opportunity for housing for seniors should they be interested, you know, as a retiree, as an empty nester, that sort of thing. Deputy Mayor Elliott, and then Councillor um, Patterson. Yeah, uh, through you, Your Worship. I think it's tough when we um, generalize what, um, you know, when we say seniors housing, I think seniors housing is different to whatever group of seniors you talk to. Some, you know, some discussions I have with seniors in our community is that they want apartments. Some seniors you talk to want the single floor um, bungalows. Um, some seniors that you talk to want more of, of you know, like a retirement home area where it's, you know, a tiny homes or whatever, or wherever you want to call them. I think it's tough to say, you know, we need seniors homes because that looks so different. And it's the same as when you say, um, you know, we need housing for young people, you know, housing for young people looks completely different to, to each family that starts out with. And so when we offer a range of housing and not just seniors housing, that is, you know, within this box, you know, we're leaving out other seniors. And so that this array of housing that we're able to offer allows us to, to meet more needs than just saying seniors housing looks like small houses on small lots, because that's not what, that's not necessarily what it is. Councillor Patterson. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that um, it's not the developer who's offering what we're offering. Uh, okay, Councillor Heeman. Um, I think we've had a really vigorous discussion here and um, a lot of a lot of pros and cons. And I think the challenge is that what we're endeavoring to do here is to regulate a market. And I think many of these things will actually be de determined by the market. Um, you know, when we talk about pricing and those are things that are largely out of our control. I think what we can do is put options forward. And I think we can do that with respect for our community. Councillor Hunter. Yeah, I would echo uh, Councillor Heeman's comments there. Um, sure, we can put the zoning in place for whatever type of housing that we want, but it, at the end of the day, it's the market that drives what the developer is going to build. So really we, you know, that's, that's the limit that we have. Deputy Mayor Elliott. Well, I'll just say boardwalk is the perfect example of that. I mean, they just came back last week or whenever our last meeting was asking for semi detached houses versus the single detached houses. And so, you know, we can approve these, these draft plan of subdivisions, but as the market changes, you know, the requests that change and even, um, the the covered porches that was all the rage a year a year or two ago when they all came all the developers started coming back wanting to more square footage to build these covered porches you know as as great as it's to set it on paper it it changes as the market changes and I, and I think that's important that we have that flexibility because you know I think that's Part of it is you do want developers to come. You do want developers to build housing and to be able to say, you know, look back and say, yeah, that does work for us, you know. And it, and I think we we are always aware of what the trends are. We are always aware of what the needs are. And when the developers are getting ahead of us and starting to anticipate the needs, I think that's a great situation. And and I think that is a boardwalk is a perfect example for that because that was envisioned as you know one. Home single family homes are now turning into something that's a little bit different, and uh, and I and I'm not sure where the perception comes. And I've I've seen it a lot lately in the letters I get that if you're living in a um, town home, then it, you aren't quite the same as somebody that's living in a single family home. And I'm not sure where that housing 
so I would I would say it's almost like a snobbery came from because everybody has different needs. You know, somebody who's traveling around the world for their job doesn't need a one acre lot that they have to maintain all the time. They need a home that they can just go in and out of and not worry about it. So I think it, sustainability is meeting the different needs of people. And it's important to keep that in mind. Councillor Heeman. Yeah, just one point. Um, I know we have a lot of um, reference to new development, but uh, I think it's also important to realize that um, we have potential infill opportunities. And I think that, you know, seeing a certain style of development in one area may not be as attractive as seeing it in another area. And so I think we just want to make sure that we're positioning ourselves uh, so that we can actually grow our town uh, holistically and, and have, uh, you know, not just a bunch of people on one side, but actually be developing a core. I think we've had discussions about that before. And, and I think that also goes into the perception of the different levels of density, having, having balanced growth throughout the, the, uh, the residential areas. And I guess maybe, um, Mr. Bancroft, you could comment on mixing commercial in with residential, because again, when you look at a European model where most people walk or cycle as opposed to getting in their car to go to the store, like having available commercial properties that's, you know, a grocery store that's close by or a um, bank that's in the development, like, I think, is that something that we should be looking towards? Uh, most certainly, Your Worship. Um, uh, there's, there's, different, there's definitely that trend in terms of more compact um, development, um, but with um, commercial areas, uh, absolutely um, an opportunity for integration with uh, residential. So, um, you know, have ground floor um, commercial uses um, along um, a busy arterial road um, with an opportunity for um, apartment units up above. And, um, you know, that's something that um, is, is lacking in the community, um, but would certainly be most welcome um, being, um, you know, an appropriate form of uh, intensification along, um, uh, you know, a, a busy stretch of road. So I certainly open that possibility in terms of um, introducing that form of uh, development. So. Councillor Patterson. Yes, thank you, Mayor Work. I think um, we got to remember that we're a agricultural rural community, and we got to be considerate of that. And we got to think, you know, do we want to urbanize or do we want to kind of stay the way our bedroom community has always been? And that's that's the dichotomy that that we're stuck with: is do we grow? Come urban, or do we stay this rural agricultural community? And from the comments that I received from the community, is they want to stay this rural bedroom community agricultural kind of thing. That's that's where I'm at right now. Now I think the, the comments that you're receiving are going to be the same comments everywhere in southwestern Ontario, and and I think people. Um, really enjoy how they live right now and when they see change that that's the comments they make that those are easy comments to make but that's not necessarily what you know how we have to look in the future because if we don't change then we're decaying Through your worship, I think, um, you know, I, I often refer back to uh, when Thorndale, when the Trails of White Creek was coming to Thorndale, um, you know, 14, 15 years ago when that discussion was happening and, and the fear amongst uh, the Thorndale community was the fear of becoming a bedroom community that, you, you know, in Thames Centre, we offer such a vibrant community of, of volunteers and supporting local and, and we have all these community events and, and the fear of becoming a bedroom community where, you know, people from the city were going to, we're going to move in and, and they would leave at eight o'clock in the morning and come back at five o'clock at night and just shut their doors and, and not participate. And, and, you know, I see that, I see those comments happening in, in Dorchester now that Dorchester starting to grow. But one thing, um, you 
you know, and, and I'll give credit to Isle of Thorndale when we started Isle of Thorndale, um, back in whenever we did that, that was a long time ago, but you know, we did that to address the fear of becoming a bedroom community because we didn't, because we wanted, as we saw growth, we knew growth was inevitable. It was coming. It was, we had new subdivisions coming in and, and we wanted them to embrace the this, this small town that we had. And, and by bringing new residents and, and um, I don't want to say old residents, but residents um, who are established in the Thorndale community, bringing businesses and, and everyone to the table to see what we could offer. You know, you look at Thorndale now and this, and the Thorndale Lions Club has one of the biggest membership Lions Clubs in, in Ontario. And, and people are supporting community events. There's support local um, initiatives happening through, through I Love Thorndale. And, and there's all of these things happening. So we didn't become a bedroom community in Thorndale. You know, everybody who's moving in is embracing the fact that, you know, Temp Center is a great place to live and, and you volunteer and all of these things happen. And I, and so I think to say that growth equals bad because it's just new people moving in and, and that's horrible um, is, is kind of a bad take to take because they can come into our community and embrace the small town and volunteer and their kids play sports and all these exciting things happen. Yeah, and I just so I'm going to add then, Councillor Patterson, it's hard to be a bedroom community uh, after the pandemic because a lot of people are now working from home. That option is there in the next, you know, three to four years. I don't think you see that rebound back to the bricks and mortar. There'll be people still working from home. And we know that that gives them more flexibility about where they want to live. They don't have to live in Toronto anymore. They can come out to our areas and they can have a productive job where they don't have to leave the community. So I think, you know, we're on the, we're kind of on the edge of a real seismic shift here. And, uh, and it would be, but we would have our blinders on if we didn't anticipate changes in the next three to four years. Councillor Heeman, oh, sorry, Councillor Patterson, and then Councillor Heeman. Uh, thank you, Mayor Work. Um, yeah, I mean, Thorndale has been a, a success for town center for us definitely um but it was it was a moderate growth and it was at a good pace and it wasn't all explosive and 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 this you know great you know expansion of housing it was just a slow growth and i think that's that's where we should go is we got to be concerned about not going too fast Okay, um, I just, you know, that we're looking at developments, if, you, if you're thinking about comparing Dorchester and Thorndale, the developments in Dorchester were always going to be there. They had to sit on their hands for a long time until council made a decision about a wastewater expansion, which took a long time down the pipes to decide to go how much. Once that happened, those people were existing. They were waiting to get in. And, and it's not an explosive growth. It's been growth that was planned by councils previous to us, by terms that knew that was going to happen. It just so happens that now the conditions are right. We do have that capacity and they're entitled to uh, fulfilling what we've promised them a long time ago. Those were development lands. And, and if they have the, uh, the means to develop them, then we can't stop that. that that's, you know, whether we determine it as explosive or steady or, or what, it's still, that's what it is. Councillor Heeman. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, it's exciting to hear about Thorndale. <laughs> um, and uh, I just wanna say, I think that, you know, we have had similar concerns about some newer de development plans. And I think that the planning may take a while, but they're really building them quick now. So I think there's a, an optics there that's a little different. Um, but, uh, you know, there's lots of great communities all throughout Southwestern Ontario. And I think that um, we have two unique villages and um, they developed a certain way. But if you, you go to Strathroy or Seaforth or Simcoe or Elmer, they had higher density in their in their course, it's not just one small town, Ontario look and feel like we have a tremendous amount of diversity that I think is unique in the world. Um, but 
I, the point being that those those were developed slowly and they were in line with the business community and the residential all coming together making that three-story walkable type arrangement and um, that's the type of balance that I think um, we should try and achieve okay any other discussion then I'll let our director of planner move on uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, so, in, so going back to these uh, residential targets uh, proposed, um, by comparison with other municipalities, uh, I want to share some data with uh, with Council um, as it applies to um, other municipalities in Middlesex County, lower tier. So for Luke and Badal, for example, um, they're in the midst of an official plan review and um, as compared to the proposed 65 35 split they are proposing an 80 20 split um, for middlesex center um, they have a 60 40 split for the kamoka kilworth area uh, mind you i'm not aware of what the policy direction is specifically for for elderton and then with uh, strathroy caradoc um, although they don't mention a split they do have a target of 25% um, of housing to be in the form of rental housing. And, um, and again, as I mentioned before, um, these targets are not etched in stone through another official plan review. If there's a need to um, make adjustments, either higher or lower, we can certainly do that. Um, but it's important because in determining the split, it assists in projecting what the anticipated demand is going to be. Um, because we know based on um, population projections, we convert that then over to um, number of households, which is basically number of housing units. And then we go and apply that to um, whatever split we decide to use moving forward. So. If there's no comments or further questions, then I'll move on to the next slide then. And then in terms of um, density, here's a comparison in terms of uh, approved subdivisions, draft and final approved compared to proposed and preliminary subdivisions. Um, and when I say density, um, this, is, uh, this is net residential density. So although it includes um, abutting local streets, it doesn't, it doesn't include uh, parkland. It also doesn't include stormwater management facilities because at the end of the day, we wanna compare apples to apples. Not all uh, subdivisions are gonna have um, a neighborhood park, for example, based on what the needs are um, in the area. And the same with a stormwater management facility, there could be more so of a regional facility, which benefits um, a number of developments. So that's why it's excluded from the uh, density calculation. Um, so in assisting um, from a growth management standpoint, um, it's important that we set um, a, a density target so that at the end of the day, we can encourage um, a more efficient land use and uh, infrastructure. So you can see based on comparing approved and proposed preliminary subdivisions, um, there's been a shift in that we go from about 11 units per hectare to um, 13 units per hectare um, on average. Um, so, um, although we've got no current standard in place in the official plan, um, we're looking at implementing something around uh, the 13 unit per hectare range, which would be reasonable and appropriate in my uh, opinion. Not sure if there's any comments or questions from council. Yes, uh, through your worship. I know um, with that, uh, uh, comments we just got uh, in regards to the Monteith subdivision. Um, there was a lot of comparisons happening to, you know, the uh, the affordable or, or the higher density that that is being proposed in Monteith versus, you know, what's available. And 
trails of Wye Creek and Foxboro and, and Rosewood and in, in uh, Thorndale. And, and I think that's important market that you address the shift happening. Um, you know, Wye Creek was approved in 2006. I think Foxboro was 2014. It was approved. Even Rosewood uh, was around 2017, 2018. Um, you know, we've seen that shift, especially in the last two years. And, and when we discussed before how, you know, sprawl was, was okay, you know, five, 10 years ago. And, and now we need to look at how to better use the land that we're starting to see those higher densities. When you look at, you know, Monteith, Hawthorne, um, and those, and those subdivisions. And so it's not, you can't compare, you know, what happened at trails of Y Creek when we approved that subdivision in 2014 versus Monteith that we just approved a couple weeks ago. Councillor Patterson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Work. Um, I understand density, um, it benefits Temp Center, it benefits the developer, but I'm still stuck on that. I don't hear any residents talking about um, they want to intensify use of land. I just don't hear those comments at all. Actually, I hear comments in a, in a, opposed to that. Um, through your worship, I, I think I'd be getting ahead of myself uh, because there's one of the concluding slides in the presentation that provides a Venn diagram, a comparison by looking at um, level of service, taxes, and density in that um, you can't have low density and a high level of service and low taxes because that does not exist. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Maybe we can, I guess we'll go back to that question when I bring up that slide. Deputy Mayor Elliott and then Councillor Heyman. Yes, through you, Your Worship. I think it's um, uh, the recommendations that came from the task force last week address this and the fact that, you know, as, as we sit around the horseshoe as a council, there are so many aspects to planning that we have to look at. It's not just, you know, what the public wants, because if we did what the public wants, you know, we wouldn't be approving any growth and we wouldn't be doing anything. And, it, and um, the recommendation that the report that came out last week addressed the new term for nimbyism, which is bananas, build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. And so, and part of those recommendations coming out last week to, to take the political side out of it is the fact that as elected officials, if we want to get reelected, we have to listen to the public. And, and, and if we do that, then we're, you know, we're not looking at everything. When, when we look at planning, we have to look at the provincial policy statement. We have to look at Middlesex County's official plan, our official plan, the planning act, you know, and then we have to take into consideration all of these different housing reports that are coming out, pressure from the federal government, pressure from the provincial government, you know, even OFA's homegrown plan to protect agricultural land. Like there's so many aspects to it that I don't think the general public realizes we even have to take into consideration when we look at this. And, you know, the comments that we received, and, and I'll go back to the Monty subdivision where, you know, there shouldn't be any affordable housing in Monty subdivision. It should be, you know, big houses on big lots because that's what we want in our backyard. And we even got the comments, affordable housing should be west of the tracks, like almost creating this segregation <laughs> in, in our communities. And so, but our responsibility as council members is to look at what's best for the community and what's best for all of the community. And, you know, you go back to those stats on, on people who can't afford, you know, can't afford these million dollar homes and can't even afford $500,000 homes. And so, you know, we have to take everybody into consideration, not just the loud people reaching out to council because they don't want affordable housing in our community. Councillor Heyman. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to address the slide and just, um, I think that it's good to have a target. I think the downside of having a, a, a kind of a quota is that sometimes you can you can uh, work around the numbers, right? So I think that you could still have a lot of uh, single detached and have a couple apartment buildings and hit your number. And I just worry about what that does to 
our overall planning goals. And so I am I would uh, welcome uh, Director Bancroft's perspective on how we can balance um, balance that growth and um, make sure we're making cohesive communities. So with these targets that are being uh, proposed, uh, your worship, um, there's no doubt that there's gonna be some development applications that will exceed um, that target. Whereas there could be some that come, you know, slightly below. But at the end of the day, um, what we're trying to achieve here is to facilitate, encourage, promote um, good planning in terms of efficient land use and um, efficient uh, use of infrastructure. Um, and these are the targets that we're trying to hit, which um, at the end of the day will make Tem Center an even better community. Um, and it's not as if um, these changes that are proposed are significant in the grand scheme of things. And I'm saying that, Your Worship, because um, the market has already reacted. So all we're doing is shifting to sort of be in general alignment with what the market is saying. So in that regard, I don't see this as um, significant change um, at the end of the day in, in dealing with the, uh, the development community. Councillor Heeman. So is it fair to say that it's more of a yardstick? Correct. Um, you know, at the end of the day, um, it's a way to um, make sure that we're heading in the right direction, that we're heading on the right path. Um, when you deal with, um, with planning policy, uh, there could be some gray areas relative to planning policy. And that's, um, that's intentional um, because, uh, you know, there could be variations here and there. Um, it's not until you get to zoning where you get more definition in terms of black and white, in terms of what the requirements are. But uh, at the end of the day, um, Councillor Heeman, we are being more so in alignment with the direction that's currently provided by um, the province through the provincial policy statements. Because we have that tool available, we just haven't implemented it in the past. And we owe it to good planning um, to ensure that we have something in place, which at the end of the day um, is, uh, is consistent with the public good and the public interest. Uh, to the um, most benefit to the municipality. Okay, any other comments? Nope. Seeing none, go ahead, Mr. Bancroft. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. So then um, let's talk about housing affordability tools. Um, now, I, th I think it's important to mention this slide in particular, even though um, it has no application in Tem Center. I just want to clear the air, and I think that's important um, because not only have there been questions from members of council about some of these tools, but even from the public themselves. So with bonusing, um, that was a section under the Planning Act that um, um, would allow a developer to provide a public benefit um, in exchange for an increasing height or density, which would otherwise not be not be permitted through zoning. Um, so that public benefit could be um, an affordable housing um, component, let's say as part of um, you know, a low rise apartment building that was proposed. Bonusing has actually been repealed through an amendment to the Planning Act. So that, that tool is no longer available. There's also the notion of inclusionary zoning, and perhaps um, uh, some members of council have heard of that phrase before, inclusionary zoning. It's used to require new housing developments to include um, affordable housing units in proximity to large uh, transit stations. 
So it really has applications to um, cities. Um, so that's certainly not applicable to, uh, to Thames Center. Also in terms of tools available, and uh, we're gonna have a, uh, I guess the next part of our council meeting at one o'clock dealing with the um, proposed development charges. Um, development charge DC deferred payments. So that's a tool that's available for rental housing and nonprofit housing. So with rental six equal annual installments and then with nonprofit 21 equal annual payments. Also, um, community improvement plans, or CIPs, as they're called for short, um, that's a tool that's available under the Planning Act, where municipalities can provide uh, financial incentives to developers to um, include um, affordable housing. I should point out that um, there is one lower tier municipality in Middlesex County that has a CIP in place um, dealing with um, a rental housing component, that's Strathroy Caradoc, where they offer incentives relative to the waiving of certain fees, um, building fees, um, also grants, and um, uh, incentives relative to development charges. So the yeah, other, the only lower tier that has something in place in that regard. Deputy Mary Elliott. Thank you. And uh, through your worship, that was one question I had asked uh, Director Bancroft uh, prior to the meeting was um, that this council, the majority of this council did not support um, implementing a CIP uh, back in 2020 here in Thames Center. And we're now the only one without one uh, in Middlesex County. But um, I had asked if there was any, um, any other communities in Middlesex that offered um, a housing um, portion with their CIP. Um, but kind of my second question to that, uh, Director Bancroft, was um, do you see if Town Center were to revisit the C uh, CIP here in Town Center, do you see any benefit to that in terms of what we could offer for housing options here? Uh, through you, Your Worship, um, I, I guess there's two sides of the coin in dealing with the question from the Deputy Mayor. On the one hand, um, the development community has already reacted in terms of making adjustments based on the housing market in terms of providing more housing choice. The other side of the coin is, um, you know, perhaps this is a tool that council is interested in um, following through on, especially if, you know, we would like to encourage um, a type of housing that is specific to a demographic, such as, you know, seniors housing, for example. If that's, if that's something that council is, is, is um, interested in doing, then certainly that's something that we could explore. Um, thank you. Councilor Heyman? Yeah, just with revisiting the CIP, I think that a lot of these tools, we've had discussions where it ultimately comes down to negotiation with the developer and what type of incentives we're putting on the table. And I think we've been very fortunate to be able to get what we want without having to uh, use too many of these tools. So I think it's, it's interesting from a future looking perspective, what is possible, but I think we've been able to do a lot Councillor Patterson, did you have your hand up? Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor Work. Um, in terms of this community improvement plan, uh, my question is the financial incentives, like is that open-ended or is that something um, council administration we will figure out and you, you put a, you know, a specific plan in place? Uh, through you, Your Worship. Um, so there are some limitations in terms of what municipalities can and can't do. And as financial incentives, um, uh, as noted, we've got waiving of fees, um, which uh, could be applied. Uh, also, um, grants, where the municipality would have to budget um, funds um, available through a grant program um, in advance. 
as well as um, incentives towards reducing or waiving development charges if that's council's wish at the end of the day. Um, I, be I believe also um, there's an opportunity for um, property tax rebate in, in some capacity, but um, yeah, I think, uh, I think that answers the councillor's question. Thank you. Councillor Patterson. Yeah, just for clarification, we can waive DCs. Is that is that legally available to council? Uh, through uh, you, your worship. Um, I, I don't know about an outright waiving of DCs, but there's an opportunity for uh, some reduction um, in some capacity. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Worship. I'll just add to that. There have been municipalities that have waived, waived DCs in the past, but they were um, that was probably five, six years ago when they were stagnant. Um, they didn't have any growth. They didn't have anything happening. Um, so they waived the DFEs to spark some of that growth, and some of them waived them in, in particular for um, in industry coming to town, that kind of thing. But I believe Leamington was one of them, if you wanted to look at an example, Councillor Patterson, that uh, they waived their DCs to spark some of the residential growth there. I'm sure they're, I'm sure they're not doing that now. And, and I see Director Grogan on the screen. So go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. And through you um, to Councillor Patterson, I'd also just like to add that if Council chooses to waive DCs, we still have to fund the costs that are associated with the projects that are related to um, that growth. So if, for example, we give an exemption over and above what is legislatively um, determined as allowable, we're required to fund that either through um, rates or through our tax rates as well. So it's something to consider. Thank you. Mr. Hunter. Yes, through you, Your Worship, that was going to be my next question or my next point that when you start deferring or giving breaks to developers, then costs still have to be made or paid for. So it comes back onto the general tax levy or services. Sir Heeman? Yeah, just, just one final comment is that when we look at these incentives, we have to be careful about the moral hazard that we're putting out into the market. And I think that when we start to put subsidize, subsidies in place for what should be normal behavior, then we end up with a much higher administrative load. And I don't think we end up with much more uh, impact. Councillor Patterson, did you have your hand up? No, okay. Thank you, Your Worship. So moving right along in terms of other housing affordability tools. So uh, second units. So that was introduced through Bill 140, which was an amendment of the Planning Act where municipalities were mandated to have policies um, to allow second units within a single detached, semi-detached and townhouse dwellings or um, accessory structures located on the same property. So accessory structures, meaning like, let's say you had a detached garage, an opportunity to convert to um, a, a second dwelling. Um, so um, our official plan does include policy direction in that regard. However, our zoning regulations are not yet in place. And then subsequent to that, uh, the province uh, changed the rules yet again in terms of dealing with ADUs, our additional dwelling units. And that was introduced through another amendment of the Planning Act through Bill 108. So this, um, amendment goes even further than second units, because what it does is um, it allows one ADU in the principal building and one in an accessory building all on the same lot for a total of three units. So you could have um, an existing property with a single detached dwelling through the introduction, for example, of a basement apartment and through a conversion or construction of an accessory building in the rear yard to accommodate um, a dwelling unit for a total of three dwelling units on that same property. Um, so our official plan, um, I've got it on my list as part of the OP review, 
to make sure that we've got the necessary uh, policy direction in place to reflect Bill 108. Um, and also the same holds true with our zoning bylaw. It's important to note that with these changes that have come about uh, provincially, they are not subject to appeal. Um, once you have them in place as part of an official plan review and also as part of a zoning bylaw update. Deputy Mayor Elliott. Yeah, I'll just, um, just a comment in terms of community feedback. I think the additional dwelling units, this is one I get a lot. I think adding the ability um, in our official plan and a zoning bylaw to allow the ADUs, um, especially in our rural um, communities where we do have larger lots that can accommodate, you know, a, a second dwelling um, is huge. And, and when you, um, you know, come back to talk about seniors housing, you know, a lot of families I hear from is this is what they're looking for because it allows their their parents to have the independence of having their own space, but allows the flexibility to allow them to be close to them, um, as well as um, for children just starting, like single um, children just starting out. Um, allowing ADUs allows just so much flexibility in terms of, of housing options um, that we don't have in our toolbox right now. Um, if I could echo the deputy mayor, um, so the market has um, reacted to um, these tools being available. And of course, that's indicative of private zoning bylaw amendments that have been filed. Um, we've had two examples um, to date that have gone through the approvals process, and um, I'm sure more are coming. Um, but this is exciting that, you know, these tools are um, available. Um, at the end of the day, to the benefit of the community. Dr. Heeman? Yeah, I'd just also like to talk about the economic benefit, especially for rural communities where you can use that platform for agritourism and even for some of the seasonal worker accommodations, where I think that's still a, a difficult um, difficult file with uh, how, it's, how the uh, building code recommendations are, but this allows for um, creating new new uh, housing stock that's multi-purpose. And, and just um, as a, an aside, I've been sitting on a planning um, committee and one of the discussions was extra houses in, in the rural area. And of course it can't be like on other spots on the farm. It has to be in the actual lot where it's determined for housing where there's septic and there's already electric it can't be in the back corner of the woods because you think that might be a nice view so you know we have to look at the regulations with that too your worship you bring a very good point because in that regard you want to prevent an opportunity for a severance down the road yeah. so that's why typically with those types of units they are clustered in proximity to um, you know the principal uh, dwelling on the property. So, moving right along, then another housing affordability tool are garden suites. So this is temporary housing, typically in the form of a mobile home um, for a maximum of ten years, according to our official plan. Uh, that uh, policy direction needs to be amended to reflect the Planning Act, which is a maximum of twenty years. So. Uh, perhaps that's a reflection of um, an increase in life expectancy. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> but uh, in any event, that's something that's, uh, that is definitely on my radar. So also in terms of encouraging housing mix, perhaps we should consider the elimination of segregating housing types through zoning to promote um, infilling intensification. Um, if I can take a step back, we were talking about targets that are available relative to density and um, housing mix. Um, another target that I should mention is relative to infilling and intensification. So currently um, our target is for housing units that are coming in, 15% um, of those should be um, attributable to opportunities for infill and intensification rather than greenfield development through um, an existing um, developed area. But again, 
um, we should consider the elimination of segregating housing through zoning, because currently um, we've got three residential zones, R1, R2, and R3. And R1 is single detached dwellings only, followed by R2, we've got single semis and duplexes. And then R3, we've got townhouses and low rise apartments. Um, so perhaps we should consider a blend of R1, R2, um, to allow low density residential uses under a single zone, uh, combined with an opportunity to allow for uh, street townhouse dwellings. And then, you know, we can keep uh, with an R3 low rise apartments and, and clustered townhouses. And when I say clustered townhouses, I mean um, a parcel of land that is developed that has basically a townhouse complex where you have an internal road network with um, a grouping of, uh, of townhouse dwellings through various blocks. Um, also, um, the need to um, make adjustments to our location criteria for medium density residential uses. It is uh, too restrictive in my opinion, and um, it should be refined. And here's, here's a breakdown of, of that criteria. Um, I see uh, Councillor Patterson has a question. Go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor Work. If we can go to that previous slide. So we're, when we talk about allowing street townhouse dwellings and low density residential areas, which I'm assuming is um, infill, every time that happens, the entire community just is not happy about it. So. I, I don't know where that comes from because every time when we when someone wants to do that, we get major pushback from it. So it seems to me the community doesn't want it. Um, th three year worship. I, I guess that's um, I guess that's the political response, um, Councillor Patterson, and and I appreciate those comments. But at the end of the day, um, I'm trying to um, apply a lens to um, encouraging um, opportunities for forms of housing that are compatible with uh, the existing area. And when I say compatible, that doesn't mean that they have to be exactly the same, that you have to have singles um, juxtaposed with singles. What it means is, um, an opportunity to have this form of development side by side. And um, although I live in the city of London and Thames Centre is not London, um, I live in a residential subdivision where there are examples of uh, townhouse dwellings um, adjacent to um, single detached dwellings, albeit on the opposite side of the road. I'm not aware of any, any unacceptable adverse impacts by having those different types of housing um, face one another. Um, because uh, what I've witnessed um, in my experience, not only as a professional planner, but personally, it works. Um, but it's, it's, it's disappointing that um, there are concerns um, from the community, and I'll just leave it on that. I, and I can t t attest to it because I, I lived in Berkshire Village for a long time, and there was exactly that. It was commercial. You know, there was a store, and there was a place where people could go to the gym, and then you had apartment buildings, and you had townhouses, and right down the road were all the single-family homes. So it does work. Like, there is intensification, and, and people, you know, need that mixture. Uh, Tom, go ahead. Just just to follow up to the previous slide where I was talking about accessory dwelling units, doesn't that make some of this superfluous in the sense that you can you can have an informal duplex uh, on any lot in any respect, and we don't have a choice over that, you know? So it's somewhat redundant from the provincial framework. Yeah, uh, through your worship, uh, Councillor Heeman hit the nail right on the head. Absolutely. So um, this next slide 
it's just a visual that I wanted to share with, uh, with council. And you may have come across this term, the missing middle. Um, and, and basically what it means is it's a range of housing types that are compatible in scale with semi or with single detached neighborhoods. The missing middle, it's, it's intended to meet the demand for walkable neighborhoods to respond to um, changing demographics and to provide housing at, at different price points at the end of the day. And this is relevant to the municipality um, to encourage, facilitate, encourage residential development opportunities beyond uh, single detached dwellings. Um, because at the end of the day, this is all about housing choice, which goes a long way in terms of promoting affordability and giving choice to existing residents in the community for all stages of their life. So I, I just wanted to bring this slide forward as a graphic example of, of those housing types that, uh, that, that could occur um, you know, in, in Dorchester and Thorndale. I have a question for you. Um, I've probably seen it, but maybe you can explain what it means. What is the cottage court? Um, so your worship, that's, it's my understanding that that's basically um, a coach house, um, kind of in the rear yard, um, that type of deal, which is converted into a, a dwelling unit. That's my understanding as to what that is. Good question. Sounds nice anyway. <laughs> <laughs> So I thought it was important also to provide a visual relative to this slide. And, and um, I mentioned at the beginning, and I'm glad that our director of finance slash treasurer is part of the discussion, because at the end of the day, we need to be fiscally responsible. So this slide comes from a world-renowned urban planner, uh, Brent Totteron who actually started as uh, earlier in his career as a planning consultant for MHBC planning out in um, Kitchener-Waterloo. And he actually assisted uh, the municipality of Middlesex Center with their first ever official plan. So that was, that was prior to my tenure with uh, Middlesex Center. I, I have never met uh, Brent, but in any event, he climbed up the ranks rather quickly and became the uh, chief planner for the city of Calgary, followed by the city of Vancouver. And he currently um, works as a, a consultant offering planning services to municipalities across Canada, um, the United States, and, and then beyond that. So um, with, through this diagram, um, it provides a comparison in terms of um, the three factors in terms of um, level of service, um, low density residential, and the desire to have uh, low taxes. And um, this is so important to avoid low density and to provide that, that housing choice in terms of um, a mix of housing types. Because at the end of the day, if you provide a mix of housing types beyond low density uh, residential development, it makes the municipality more fiscally responsible um, at the end of the day in terms of promoting um, efficient land use and efficient infrastructure. I know I, I like to use those terms quite often, your worship, as you're probably aware, mm -hmm. but it's, it's paramount here because this Venn diagram um, exemplifies uh, you know, that, that, that very point, that very notion. So if there's any comments, so. Councilor Heyman. Would you consider water and wastewater a tax or a service? <laughs> I think you can say basically both because, you know, the, the two go hand in hand because at the end of the day, you need to replace that infrastructure. 
And the only way you can replay that to replace that infrastructure is through the raising of taxes. So. I, it's a bit of a facetious question, but I raise that because it's, it, it seems that uh, density does uh, help with our, our funding formula for those two. And that's something I think that we hear a lot about. CEO Henry. Uh, through your worship, um, I'm, I'm a little surprised that uh, Mark didn't get a chance to meet Brent. I did actually get the chance to meet Brent recently. <laughs> and uh, and one, of these, uh, one of these slides came up in something he was presenting to, and it was, it was indicative of what council faces on a day-to-day -day basis when you're getting um, streams from your constituents out there and the people that you represent that they want low taxes, they want stable services, and they want low density, but those things just don't all exist. Or And we're just trying to find a way to help you coexist with all of this as we're going through a time that is unfathomable. We've never encountered this much growth all at once. And it is it is something that I don't envy you for as a uh, as members of council, because once again, in this in this last couple of years, you know, you've faced two things that are that are unprecedented, and one is a, a pandemic in our times, and the other, obviously, is this growth that we're seeing that uh, we just have to find a way to control. So, just in closing, with my presentation, uh, your worship. Um, I just want to hit back on those key points in terms of the importance of uh, housing mix. And again, more cost effective leading to a more efficient use of land and infrastructure creates a more sustainable community by having housing choices to, um, you know, address all um, cycles of uh, one's lives and, you know, to give our residents the choice to stay in the community. Um, and that's not only um, in terms of seniors but also for um, those that are, are, are starting off, um, you know, in their youth and then becoming young, young adults, that sort of thing. And then lastly, protection of agricultural land. We got to use land more efficiently and encourage infill uh, intensification opportunities. And uh, we can certainly um, achieve that by um, promoting, encouraging, facilitating that, uh, that housing mix with those types of opportunities. Questions, comments? <laughs> and I guess what I'll do, Your Worship, is I'll leave the, the presentation on the screen in case we wanna go back to some of the slides. So I have a question. Do you think we could do better? I think at the end of the day, there's always room for improvement. And I, I don't care if it's um, something that um, as individuals, what we do, or, you know, or if, if we're looking at the corporation as a whole in terms of the municipality, there is always room for improvement. Um, and um, I, I guess going back on this presentation, one thing that we haven't even talked about which I think is, is at the pinnacle, which is paramount, is climate change. Mm -hmm. And climate change actually fits right into the need to provide that broader mix of housing um, because it's all interrelated. You know, we want to encourage that compact built form. We want to encourage walkability we want to bring back the corner store so that you don't have to go in your car and drive to pick up a bag of milk. Um, it, it's all interrelated. So to answer your question, absolutely, there's room for improvement. But at the same time, I'm not looking at making any drastic changes um, because at the end of the day, um, I, I think it's important that we facilitate change um, because at the, ultimately um, we're not the development industry. Um, but at the same time, we have invested 
significant dollars, millions of dollars in infrastructure with our water supply system, with our sanitary sewage system. And we wanna make sure that we have um, uh, the best return on investment that we can get. Because as I pointed out before, we're gonna to have to replace those pipes. And that's why we have to um, be very, very careful in terms of the type of development that we encourage moving forward so that we can be fiscally responsible with the way we do things. It, it's ironic. I wish I'd listened a little bit closer when I was driving in this morning, but the CBC in the news report, and if somebody heard it and they listened to it closer than I, please correct me, but they were talking about the cost of flooding to housing. And I think it was $85,000 per house added into additional expenditures for flooding. So, I mean, climate change is a, is a real big deal. Like it is something, and, and you know, I, I know a lot of people have questioned the wisdom of storm management um, costs and plans, but I, we have to look to mitigating flooding. And I know, I know what we, our drainage act and our conservation authorities are questioned all the time, but those, those are steps in preventing um, climate change affecting us greatly. Like, I think it's important that we realize the value of those just because we don't always see a flood doesn't mean that that wouldn't have happened. You know, and anybody that's called Tem Center should be pretty cognizant of that. <laughs> and I think there's some questions, comments. Go ahead. I'll just finish up on Mark's thought. You, you'd asked what, what you can do better. And, I, and I've had the opportunity to witness you all um, listen to your to your residents and, and hear them through. Um, I think what, what everybody needs to realize is um, if you don't know, and I'm sure you do, there are, there are eight separate groups out there that are asking for different things. There's, there's the youth that are coming up that can't afford a house. There's the people that want to retire and they want to go into an apartment building. There's the others that want the single floor um, um, condo or, or residence that they can put their car in the garage and go to Florida for the winter, that kind of thing. And then there's the people that want the standard large lots that, uh, that have always been traditional to the neighborhood they're coming up through. So I, I commend you all from a standpoint of you, you've done that right. Um, there's a few things that, that can be considered from a serviceability standpoint that I think you should be aware of. And, and that is um, building height. Um, we're in a position right now, we're not in a position, sorry, right now to, to uh, protect a home that or a building that's over you know four stories so those are things that need to be considered because that comes at a cost down the road when we have to put a truck in place to be able to assist the, the community with that right um, you've got uh, you've got um, we're expanding on some of our services that we're offering um, but that comes with a little bit of growth and I think the big thing that you're up against here is is is, is the looming restrictions or ability that you're going to have to affect planning moving forward and the appeal process associated with that is that the developers are becoming increasingly creative on how they're coming to the table with things and how they're presenting things and forcing hand of, of the uh, politicians in those. But at the end of the day, I know, I know firsthand that they're open to listen. And if you don't like something in a, in a, um, a subdivision, I know Mark's been really good to go back and say, can we change this? Can we tweak this? Can we make this different? And they will listen to ultimately, you know, make those changes moving forward. So I know you've got a couple that are looming, but I wanted to add in the comments from a serviceability standpoint and costs associated from an administrative uh, point of view. Okay, so I have Councillor Heeman, then Councillor Elliott. Yeah, I just wanted to circle back on the uh, topic of depoliticizing these the issue of, of uh, development and um, I'm just wondering if you have any feet or any comments on or director Bancroft uh, I think things that are common are less political and um, I think that we need to send a clear signal to the development community so that they can move on with their business and and move forward in a in a straightforward manner um, and I think that once we get a set of expectations that are reasonable and agreeable, then I think the community will, will <clears throat> they'll give us their feedback. Um, but uh, I'm just wondering if there's a way that we can set that clear signal and it, that uh, I hopefully can depoliticize some of these things that if, if we, we build that standard, then it's, 
it's easier to reproduce. Through your worship. So in, in dealing with uh, a development proposal, uh, of course, we all know that it's human nature. Um, people don't like change, generally speaking. They much prefer the status quo to be maintained. But I guess at the end of the day, um, we certainly have to consider um, all comments that are provided by concerned residents. But at the same time, we also have to have an understanding of the silent majority that, um, you know, have not commented on a particular proposal, but at the end of the day, um, you know, could be satisfied with what is being proposed. So I think that's always something important um, to take into account. Uh, but at the same time, your worship, I, I've always said this, and, I've, I, and I'm pretty sure I've mentioned this to you before, as well as to all members of council. I've got the easy job because, you know, like my role is to evaluate submissions, take into account um, comments received, and, you know, to try to steer the municipality down the right path from a planning standpoint. But at the end of the day, I'm not the decision-making body. So I, I, much, I, I have the much easier role compared to um, the elected officials. So. Deputy Mayor Elliott and then Councillor Heeman. Is there a follow-up? Because I'm going to go on. There's a follow-up, yeah. <laughs> no, there's a follow-up. Well, I'm just wondering, um, I think we have this, this uh, you know, there are, are uh, environmental factors. Um, financially um that are have given us this opportunity but it's also a kind of unique position in our um, official plan review where we're we have a little i think a little bit more influence on on the uh the zoning amendments that are being put forward to us and i think that's that's an interesting opportunity for us to to um, explore in kind of a perfect storm. And I think we can have a little bit more influence on the the uh, the exact layout than we would normally, right? So you talk about Calgary and Vancouver and they have completely different planning frameworks in those provinces that do allow for much more influence on the, the form of development. And I guess with my question about reasonable expectations is that, I think it re does require a lot more back and forth with the community, with the developer to achieve that balance um, and and to have some predictability in it is a benefit. But is, is there some way that, you know, if you go back to um, high density, I personally, I think it's not a bad thing for them to be located to an arterial road and a park. Um, but I, you know, it, I, but I would like to see more of that and in the right place. So I'm just wondering if there's there's ways out outside of um, the official plan or or through our normal amendments that we can provide that uh, leadership. Um, through your worship, uh, I, I guess there in providing that leadership, there could be opportunities to um, you know provide more engagement, um, you know, with the public. Um, with uh, prior to um, a plan of subdivision application being presented before council, have, have an open house that the municipality could facilitate so that um, you know, we could talk about uh, a planning proposal in advance of it being presented before council. Um, that's, that's an approach and a style that I've used um, in the past. But at the same time, that can, very, that can be very time consuming um, in terms of, um, you know, not having the resources available because at the same time, like there are other um, matters that have to be dealt with, responsibilities um, that have to be dealt with, um, you know, with uh, myself and uh, the other planner, um, Ms. Curtez from uh, Middlesex County that assists uh, from a planning advisory services standpoint. Um, it's, it's a good question, um, but I think it has everything to do with public awareness 
and, and getting the message out there um, ahead of time before um, you know proposals are brought forward uh, for council's consideration at a public meeting. Um, it, I've it, in using that approach, yes, it's time consuming, but there are ben benefits because it gives you an opportunity to clearly, um, you know, concisely explain the nature of the proposal, which may appease concerns before the proposal is brought forward to uh, to council ultimately at the public meeting. I think you're right. I think, you know, it is our duty to educate and also let people have reasonable expectations. And when I say educate, you know, I've, I've responded to numerous letters over the last four or five months, you know, with people questioned about water, questioning about um, just different things that are very, very carefully considered by the province that are that are that those those boxes have to be checked. You know, I, I don't know um, how people think how planning goes, but I think there's a lot more to it than um than they think. And I think by putting things like the list of um, studies on our website so people can go back and review them and see them is part of that education and process. And it's a great tool to be able to say to somebody, yes, those studies are done. Yes, they're on the website. Yes, they're going. And then when I say reasonable expectation, so when I see uh, comments coming in saying, my street is is a dead end. I want it to stay a dead end because I, I want my children to play on the street. That is not a reasonable expectation of use of what's going on. That is why we have rec centers. That is why we have parks. That is why there's backyards because it, you know it may be looks safe to have a quiet street, but it's still a street. And you know the next headline is child killed by a dump truck because they're playing on the street and it, and it's it's not reasonable to assume that your street's going to stay the same and and uh, and I I totally get people being worried about their children but it, again it's all about reasonable expectation and I think you're next deputy mayor Elliot sure I'll just kind of um before I, I go on my path I'll just kind of joke how we're talking about increasing public engagement when the recommendations from the housing task force were to decrease public engagement. <laughs> um, so uh, to go off on, on, on my path, I'm going to take a little bit different direction and just go back to um, uh, something that we've already discussed before, but I think it's important to talk about is as in terms of urban sprawl and, and where we are and where we've kind of reached this fine line on on solving a housing crisis by building more housing, but at the same time, protecting our agricultural land. And, and that's really important. I know my grandpa always said, you know, in Middlesex County and then specifically here, and he would always use West Nazary Township, but we have the best farmland in all of Canada here. And, and how do we protect that? And um, I'll maybe just give a little shout out. Um, Crispin Colvin is actually on the Craig Needles podcast tomorrow um, talking about this. Um, so if you want to listen to the Craig Needles podcast, <laughs> um, it's, um, it'll be a really good discussion on, on that. But um, for anyone who hasn't read um, the homegrown policy that the Ontario Federation of Agriculture took out, I think it's a really powerful um, and really useful resource, particularly in um, places like Tem Center and across Middlesex County, where um, we have this push from the public that we need to protect our farmland, uh, which is absolutely true. We absolutely have to do that, but we also have to look at at building housing and where that comes and where the and OFA stance they've taken is we need to look at infilling. We need to look at better using the land. And, and I know when I did an interview back in the fall, you know, I use the reference that farmers now are are growing more food on less land because that's what they've had to do. And now it's our responsibility to put more housing units on less land because that's what we have to do now. You know, urban sprawl was okay for so long. And now we're at this critical point where we can't do it anymore. And, and I know the discussion between Craig and Crispin came from, um, 
uh, subdivision in Allegan County, or sorry, in Oxford County that's coming out where they're planning a, a very large subdivision on, on prime ag agricultural land. Um, and so we have to be very careful on how we do this, but, but that density and offering the mixed use when we can in order to increase that density um, is, our, is our responsibility as elected officials to have the most efficient use for our land. Okay. Councillor Patterson. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, work. Um, uh, two questions, or maybe one, two little, two part of it is: if there's a, is there a housing crisis, crisis in Temp Center, and if so, what's the data to support that we have that crisis? It's funny that you should say that because I just have a letter from the CEO of the County of Middlesex, and I'm just going to go back to the actual. Um, yeah, we, we have, we do have high housing crisis. We have a lack of affordable housing, a lack of rental housing, uh, two of the biggest issues. Finding affordable housing in Middlesex County is difficult with the currency vacancy rate. There's 1.5%. There's essentially no available housing. In total, 45% of renters in Middlesex County are spending more than 30% of their income on housing costs, uh, a statistic we heard at the beginning, and that approximately 10% of Middlesex residents live in low-income households and struggle to pay bills and put food on the table. So I would say, yes, we have a housing crisis. Absolutely. Councillor Patterson? So just... That's Middlesex County, but that's not Thames Center Pacific. But we are. But that's that's based on figures all over the county, and that includes Thames Center. And it's and funny, it, you know. It, I includes, just it, just it, one it, second, it, Councillor Patterson. Let just let me continue. It it is interesting when we talk about Thames Center, how there seems to be blinders on, how people don't believe this is happening in our community. And I ran into that once with a, a breakfast program where people question the idea of having a breakfast program because children were not going without food in Temp Center. And we all know, you know, it's not poverty sometimes, it's living arrangements. Maybe it's a separation agreement where a child gets dropped off just before school and doesn't have breakfast. Maybe it's um, just, you know, working and not able to provide the child with good meals all the time. Maybe it's getting on the bus at six o'clock in the morning and not having time to have breakfast before you get to school. But this happens and, and we can't keep our blinders on and pretend it's not happening. And, and I understand that you're looking for statistics to Temp Center, but the county statistics are real, they're current, and they include all over. And we can't think we don't have any problems here because we do. Go ahead, Councillor Patterson. And those the Middlesex County, that includes the City of London, is that correct? No, no, that's strictly county. It's nothing to do with the City of London, separate figures. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Councillor Heyman? Um, yeah, I'm a common sense guy. And uh, when we first started talking about this, looked up how much, what's the average income? And then how do you make a mortgage out of that? And so the average income, according to Statistics Canada for Elgin, Middlesex, London, which includes Thames Center, um, is $90,000. So that's kind of high by my uh, estimate. So if you think the average income is lower than that, it makes the problem a little bit more difficult. So on those types of income, you, you can only really afford 600000 And I don't really think that that's entry level, but that is what we have in our current market. You, if you find a house for under half a million dollars, that's a, that's a bargain right now. So I think we're right at that marginal level where a mortgage instrument no longer works for the average resident of Tim Center. Okay, any additional comments? Councillor Hunter. Yes, Your Worship, just a couple of comments that we have to keep in mind that, as the planner has, has stated, that this infrastructure that goes in the ground, we still have to maintain that and replace that at some point. So the further out we sprawl, the higher that cost is. So if we can work with the developers and the community to intensify some of these new developments, in the long term, that is going to, to make a, a substantial savings. 
And my second point would be that I know we've set up a committee to work with the school boards for education, but we still have to keep that in mind that, you know, it's all right to do all this development, but we also have to have the schools to go along with it. And we certainly need the school board to be listening and planning hand in hand with us when we do this. Deputy Mayor Elliott. Yeah, I'll just uh, jump off Councillor Hunter's point there. And, and in terms of we're coming up to a provincial election, a lot of these issues we're discussing are provincial issues and changing the funding model because right. So um, for those listening that don't know the way the funding model works is that the school board can't build a new school or put an addition on a new school until enough kids are being bussed out of our community in order to warrant a school, even port portables on a schoolyard do not count towards uh, an addition. So we have to be busting out all those kids before they will even look at a capital project in order to build, um, to build an addition or build a new school, which we all know we need. And so, I mean, I've, I've been saying it for a lot of years, um, you know, the Community Schools Alliance and all these organizations that we participate in, the funding model for this has to change. Like, it has to change at the provincial level. It's, it's provincial responsibility. And, and with a provincial election coming up, like, this has to be front of mind for us. Okay, any other discussion? Right. So uh, our next meeting is fairly shortly. Uh, it would be Monday, February 14th at 1 p.m. for our regular meeting. And, oh, sorry. Yep, sure. Uh, a motion to receive the presentation that Mark gave us and to adopt, yeah. Okay, just to receive, yeah. Uh, Deputy Mayor Elliott, seconded by. Councillor Heyman, I'll, any comments? Other than thanks to, uh, uh, thanks to everyone that was involved in uh, planning and having this discussion today. I think it was worthwhile. And uh, I know that was extra work, but I think it was a good one to have. So thank you for all attending. Councilor Human, did you have a comment? Yeah, could I? Sorry. We're not, you know, we haven't called it yet. We're just a comment. Oh, well, I'll wait for the vote to be called. Okay. All right. So all in favor? Okay. So carried. And Councilor Human? Yeah, I would like to make a motion that. Um, Director Bancroft uh, file a form a report with uh, reflecting the council's vision for a review at a later date. Because if this was a visioning session, we should have a summary of the, it should be reflected in, in policy in future. I, do we have any action items coming out of this? Uh, I, I can help your worship. I think, I think in this situation is the visioning session was to get an idea of what council wanted to see moving forward and what their abilities were and where they, they uh, would fall short if that be the case. I do believe that this will be reflected in the official plan as it comes forward over the next coming weeks. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I would have seen it more as an educational uh, time than a, a time to make action, but now we have the information that we can make some good decisions. So thank you. Um, Motion to adjourn, and it's now 11 o'clock right on. Councillor Hunter, your hand went up like a an arrow. <laughs> and then um, Deputy Elliott seconded. All in favor? Great. We'll see everybody at 1 o'clock.